Hey guys, welcome to the vlog. So today I'm going to talk about a salary report that I found on the interwebs. It's by a company, Vittery. I'm going to overlay the, uh, the report so you guys can see it. So um, let me just read the intro paragraph and we'll get into the details. San Francisco, the tech hub of the U.S., is a great place to start when examining data about the technology industry. One of the many benefits of working with Vittery as an employer or job seeker is access to the extensive insight derived from our online talent marketplace. So I have no relationship with this company. It's just an interesting report that uh, proves a point I've been making for a while now. So we'll get into it in about two seconds here. Let me continue. One of our goals is to increase access and transparency in the recruiting industry, and we've seen one theme continually surface as needing the most clarity, salary. We believe having all parties on equal footing is a first step to improving the hiring experience for everyone. The data we've collected for this report is based on actual active San Francisco-based hiring companies and, and their willingness to pay for talented individuals in the tech sector. As a leader in the space, San Francisco is a great benchmark for the industry in general. This is based out of San Francisco. This is the highest tech of the high techs, you know, so it's pretty high tech. And uh, so let's look at this. Average salary by role. To provide a meaningful metric for employers and job seekers, we began breaking down salaries by experience and role. Among the roles we analyzed, we found that data scientists and DevOps engineers demonstrate the highest growth in salary progression. Notably, there is a meaningful premium associated with experienced data scientists who have more than four or more years of experience compared to similar salary progression in other roles. So let me just point out something about data scientists. You need to have a data scientist degree, so years of training. Versus if you do full stack or front end developer, mobile developer, you don't need to do four years. You could be self-taught, online taught, show a good portfolio, and you're going to get a job that is neck and neck with what the data scientists are making. Let me show you how close it is. So for example, if you look at the top of the list, I'll try to overlay it here. And just in case you're listening to this on audio, uh, for the first year, Front end engineer makes 91 on average, back end engineer makes 94, full stack makes 89, mobile 92, product management 96, data science 96, DevOps 96, QA engineer 85, design 83. So some of you may be going, oh my God, data scientists are making 96 and those loser back end engineers are only making 94. You got to look at that in terms of percentages. You're just looking at a difference of, a, you know, a hundred dollars a paycheck or something. It isn't much of a difference. Now you have to think about the data scientists. They're going to have to spend years and years and years in uh, school to get that degree. And the uh, front end, the back end, the full stack guys, uh, they don't have to. As I said, you can get up and running. And uh, within a year, you can find yourself entry-level positions in front-end front end engineer, back-end, full-stack. This is all web stuff. Mobile, which is mobile development. You don't need that data science degree or that higher education to be able to get those jobs. So if you think about that, you factor that in. People who become data scientists, you're looking at four, what, four years minimum extra schooling? Minimum? Meanwhile, you working in the field making 90,000 a year, you're four years ahead. You're almost 400 grand ahead of the data scientists when they get into it. Hard to catch up to you. Uh, but let's go forward with just one to two years experience. Front end engineer makes 109, the back end makes 112, the full stack makes 110, and the data scientist 110. So you see already the web people catch up on average within a year, just a year or two experience, they catch up to the data scientist without having to go through the higher education necessarily. And, and if you continue on down the track, you see, again, um, on average, the back end engineer is 136, the full stack 136, the mobile developer 139, and the data scientist uh, 143. Again, 
the difference between 146 and 143 is a tiny, you know, it's a little thing. It's not much. And this is average. And this is for people getting jobs, right? So the point I'm trying to make here is that you shouldn't be necessarily chasing after the money because at the end of a day, whether you become a data scientist, whether you do mobile, whether you do full stack or front end, the salaries are all within the ballpark of each other. You know, if the data, if the data scientist can afford to buy himself a, a nice a fancy car, so can you, right? There's not much of a difference. Another thing is that I would argue that full stack is a better choice because you have the much more flexibility in types of work you do, and you also have a lot more flexibility in terms of what kind of job you get. You know, you go work for a large corporation, small. You could go freelance. There's all kinds of different things you can do. And I, I would imagine data scientists are a lot more limited because it's much more of a specialized thing, although there's a lot of demand. Then you're talking about San Francisco salary pre premiums, next chart. While there are many components that go into determining a salary, location tends to be one of the top factors. Again, something I've been teaching you guys for a long time now. When you're looking at salaries, you always have to look at the location you happen to be in because a house in San Francisco is going to cost you a hell of a lot more than a house in Ohio or a house in... You get the idea. So you have to look at the location, where you live, where you want to live, and look at salaries that way. And in fact, you might be making much less on paper doing a particular job in one city, but you may be living a very high, as high a quality of life or not much better if you live in an area where a house doesn't cost you a million dollars, it costs you 200 grand. I hope you understand that. You got to kind of look at all the different pieces. Anyway, so they, in the next chart they, they they look at san francisco premiums and you see a range between i don't know five percent to eleven percent premium for somebody living in san francisco versus new york city but let's let's forget about that let's go to the next chart just the chart i wanted to uh point out to you guys now this is derived from data in uh san francisco they say in this report notable observations include the relative premium associated with python especially when compared to dotnet and php we have fallen slightly out of favor, which has fallen slightly out of favor in recent years. Additionally, average junior salaries in for Ruby, although a high demand skill is likely moderated by recent coding school graduates that focus on Ruby on Rails. And this is a 218 report, so let me uh, refute a couple things here before you start going crazy about all this. Hold on, I'm just going to zoom this in for myself. All right. So they're saying that um, Python is moving ahead of PHP and Java. So first year, Python guy make a hundred bucks, hundred bucks the hour. Ruby on Rails ninety seven, Java ninety nine, PHP ninety nine, PHP dead PHP ninety nine. Wow, those Python guys, whew, Python guys, notable premium. I don't understand that PHP ninety nine versus a hundred. One dollar? One percent more? I don't know if that's a notable premium. You notice on the list, .NET and Ruby on Rails are l lower than PHP. Can you imagine that? Dead PHP is, according to this, doing better. But let's see. Let's move on two to four years. Again, these are averages. Uh, Python, 114. Uh, Ruby on Rails, 112. Oh, yeah, PHP, .NET, 108, 108. So after a two to four year range, they're making this a tiny bit less, less than 1% less, right? So yeah, PHP not doing so good. C++, eh, not bad, you know. So JavaScript 109. But let's go to the end. Let's go, you know, four, four to six, six years experience. And you notice that, uh, again, Python 124, Ruby on Rails 122, Java 122, uh, PHP 113 on average. So it's a little bit lower, uh, a little bit lower, uh, like six, seven percent lower on average, .NET, a little bit uh, higher, but if you go right to the end, six plus years experience, things start to really even out, right? So Python 136, Ruby on Rails 35, Java 134, PHP 130, .NET 129, 134 for C++, 130 for JavaScript, so JavaScript, PHP the same. You know, 130, 136, you know, three, 4% more, I guess, for Python people on average, according to their survey, but you know, it's uh, it's all within ballpark, as I said. So 
that's why I always tell people, don't get so concerned about what language you learn, because you can pivot from this language to the next, not a big deal. And at the end of the day, if you learn any of these things and you're at a competent skill level, you'll do well. You'll be making very good money, very good money. And again, one of the things that um, I emphasize is that um, you have to find work that's popular in your area. You know, even though they say Python is huge, you may be living in an area geographically where there's not doing, they're not doing too much Python. I don't know. It depends. Um, I also say consider the type of work that you want to do. You know, you may really love Ruby on Rails, then write Ruby on Rails. You may really prefer .NET, then write .NET. You know, these are averages, right? And it could be a, several different factors that figure into these averages. Uh, one thing I have to say, and some people come to me, to, a lot of people watch this channel, they're interested in the whole business end or the freelancing end of things. That's something to consider, right? You know. Of all these languages, the easiest language in terms of freelancing is PHP because it's so widely used with small business. Again, let me just point out, I'm not saying PHP is technically the best language out there. Not at all. All I'm just saying is that to say that it's some dead language nobody uses is, is ridiculous. It's just a ridiculous statement. Whoever tells you that, they're, mis they're misleading you. Um, these are all good languages. I would be happy to program with all these languages except Ruby. No, I'm just kidding. Ruby is a good language too, except, you know, it's super slow. You're going to have to spend three times as much on your servers to get anything done. It's, uh, I'm just kidding. No, actually, it's, it's slower than PHP. Okay, enough with the Ruby jokes. No, they're all, I would be happy to program in all these languages, to be honest with you, except for C. You know, it's all good. So there you go. I think um, there's more to this report about they get into things like uh, premiums are paid for certain skill sets. You know, Angular, not, not too much of a premium here, 0.4%. Node.js, a little bit higher. iOS, React, higher. Uh, D3.js, never used that. Django, that's Python, full stack uh, framework, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's others up here. But again, don't make the uh, mistake of chasing a few dollars because an extra two, three K a year, four K a year, doesn't add up too much when you consider how the taxes kick in and everything. So I wouldn't get too concerned. Be more concerned about what you want to do. Be more concerned about what's happening in your part of the world and in terms of where the demand is. And also understand that once you learn how to program in JavaScript, you could jump over easily to Python easily to PHP, pretty easily to Java, although it's a bit more work there because of the nature of Java. But if you know Java, you can go to C-sharp pretty easily. Anyway, you get the idea. I hope this video is useful to you. Again, my goal here is not to bash languages or to say that PHP is the best. I just want to point out how the reality of the situation, you can't let the script kiddies out there give you this, this illusion that if you learn the wrong language, you're going to be nowhere. Or if you learn this language, you're going to be making oodles of cash more than somebody else who's using another language. It's just not the case. If you want to really increase your salary and your earning potential as a developer, once you know your foundations, develop good communication skills. Number one, written and verbal. That's going to be huge in terms of advancing you in your career. As I stated in a previous vlog, a recent vlog, those who can communicate well, can listen, can speak well, can uh, deal with people, they're going to skyrocket much more quickly than the uber nerd who knows another framework or another language. So learn to communicate well, first and foremost. And if you learn some basic business skills so you can think like the, the decision makers in the business or if you're freelancing, especially if you're freelancing, it's good to have some business skills because uh, being able to understand the motivations and the thinking of the business uh, decision makers is going to give you a huge advantage in the marketplace as well. Much bigger advantage than learning, again, learning a new framework or something. You have to look at all these languages and technologies. You have to look at them as being just tools in your toolbox and you pull them out on a need to nerd basis and uh, away you go. All right, I hope this is useful. Bye-bye.